People across America this morning, especially the Midwest, sweeping across the Midwest right now, temperatures set to plunge well below zero. And what you're seeing right there is a live look at some roads in Twin Cities, Minnesota. Schools there are shut down this morning. Same for some other places like Chicago. A lot of kids getting a snow day today. Well, speaking of Chicago, Cecilia, the Chicago River freezing over. That's where wind chills could drop 50 degrees below zero. That city is set to have one of the its coldest days in history. Hey, good morning, Ryan. That's right. We are getting ready for that bitter cold. Now you can see it's already snowing here right now, which means the morning commute is going to be a complete headache. And take a look behind me here. Underneath all of that snow and ice is actually Lake Michigan. The deep freeze is headed our way. Overnight, dangerous weather across the country as life-threatening cold gets ready to move in. Parts of the Midwest bracing for some of the coldest temperatures in years. In North Dakota, strong gusts combined with heavy snow creating treacherous and worsening road conditions. And freezing rain and slippery road conditions causing this car to spin out of control and into an embankment. Snow blowing across Minnesota's Highway 75 North creating blizzard-like conditions. In the east, multi-car accidents shutting down Pennsylvania's I-90, like these cars going off the road. And this car crashing under this tractor trailer. Whiteout conditions not helping emergency crews and plows clear the roads. In Vermont, a combination of snow and heavy rain breaking up ice jams are rapidly flowing into a local waterfall creating flooding concerns. The Huffington Post reports that long-term lawyers and activists who are battling to ensure that transgender people can serve openly in the U.S. military are convinced they will prevail. However, they are braced for hurtful consequences if the Trump administration proceeds with its plan to sharply restrict such service. After a 5-4 vote in the U.S. Supreme Court, the administration gave the green light to put the policy into effect even as legal challenges move forward. Details of how the Trump plan might go into effect remain unclear. Some currently serving trans personnel might be able to remain in the military. Activists doubt the current Republican-controlled Senate would move to block the transgender ban and it would face a potential Trump veto if it did so. For LGBT rights leaders, Trump's proposed ban is only one of several attacks on transgender Americans. The concern over measles and tonight a public health emergency has now been declared in Washington state. And authorities there say there is a common thread. They also say if someone infected visits a store or a restaurant, a school, that that virus then hangs in the air for up to two hours. ABC's chief national correspondent Matt Gutman is in Vancouver, Washington for us. That measles outbreak growing by the hour. My biggest concern is the numbers increase that we lose a child to this disease and something that is completely, utterly preventable. Tonight, at least 30 of the 35 patients sickened with the measles in Clark County, Washington, were never vaccinated. There are an additional 11 suspected cases. Experts here warn the public might have been exposed at a recent Portland Trailblazers game at Portland's airport, at area schools, a local Costco, and Ikea. Washington State has been called a hot spot because of its anti-vaccine movement. It has one of the lowest vaccination rates in the country, but it's not just in the Northwest. New York State has registered 184 measles cases in just the past four months. The highly contagious virus can live on surfaces or in the air for up to two hours. Callie Cato's two-year-old daughter is immunocompromised after a recent liver transplant. How does this outbreak affect you? I'm worried. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very worried. Measles had all but disappeared in the U.S. after widespread use of the vaccine, but in recent years, it's made a comeback. The number of measles infections has tripled just since last year, David, and now the World Health Organization considers reluctance to vaccinate one of its top 10 global threats for 2019. David. ABC's Matt Gutman with us uh, tonight. Matt, thank you. Business Insider reports that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have released an investigation notice warning people that hedgehogs may be the carriers of salmonella. The notice came after 11 people reported being infected with salmonella, 10 of whom had contact with pet hedgehogs. Following this outbreak, the CDC is telling people about the best ways to avoid contacting salmonella a bacteria that causes 23,000 hospitalizations and 450 deaths in the United States annually. According to the CDC, washing your hands and abstaining from kissing or cuddling hedgehogs 
regardless of how cute they are, can help prevent the contraction and spread of salmonella. In addition to taking these precautions, being aware of salmonella symptoms can help expedite treatment if necessary. Most people who get salmonella will develop diarrhea, fever, and stomach cramps between 12 and 72 hours after being exposed to the bacteria. According to Reuters, the governor of Illinois has issued an emergency preparedness plan ahead of what is expected to be a historic polar vortex of cold air and wind that will consume much of the U.S. Governor J.B. Pritzker is warning residents that temperatures are likely to plummet well below zero. Pritzker has also warned that wind chill could drive temperatures to negative 55 degrees Fahrenheit in northern Illinois on Tuesday evening. Temperatures this low are capable of causing frostbite in a matter of minutes. The polar vortex weather system is expected to send freezing winds that circulate around the North Pole across much of the United States, from the Dakotas through New England. It's one of the most porous and dangerous border areas in the world. The frontier between Afghanistan and Pakistan, often the scene of cross-border attacks. The American and Afghan governments consider the border to be the focal point of the Haqqani network. Its fighters are affiliated to the Taliban. They are accused of orchestrating some of the deadliest attacks against U.S. soldiers over the last 17 years of war in Afghanistan. Facing mounting international pressure and U.S. financial sanctions, the Pakistanis are sealing the border, building a steel fence designed to stop the flow of weapons and fighters. We have uh, done a great deal to bring the normalcy back to North Pakistan. The mere fact that today I have brought the media here to interact with the local people for themselves and they will come to know that what change has come to North Pakistan. This is the place where even the security forces couldn't have moved so freely. But the fence is further straining ties between the neighbors. It's being built along the Durand line. The border demarcation drawn by the British in 1893, which Afghanistan does not recognize. Leaders in Kabul say parts of the fence are being built on Afghan soil. This belt, I think this is designed to sort of create a separation between the people of the same ethnicities who yet again lives on this, uh, both sides of this border. But the Pakistani government says it's determined to complete the fence as well as rebuild destroyed villages to encourage people displaced by the conflict to return home. Slowly, gradually, everything is coming back to normal. Earlier schools, hospitals and infrastructure were destroyed, but now it's been reconstructed after the military operation and the restoration of peace. Shops and markets are open. Very soon we'll be having a new Waziristan. About 900 of almost 2,600 kilometers on the border has already been fenced. Army commanders say the rest will be completed by next year. Philippine authorities are gearing up for the rehabilitation of the heavily polluted Manila Bay. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources on January 22nd held a meeting with stakeholders to officially kick off the cleanup tribe January 27th. Nearly 200 representatives from different agencies and government units were present during the meeting. According to Environment Secretary Roy Simatu, the government is determined to bring back the old Manila Bay. He added environmental law offenders will be punished. The move to rehabilitate the 2000s square meter bay was ordered by President Rodrigo Duterte earlier this month. Hotels have been issued warnings and sewage treatments at the Manila Zoo, which DNR previously called the major pollutant, was ordered temporarily closed. DNR said 47 billion pesos or $900 million is needed for the rehabilitation of the bay. Top-level government officials lined up to announce the U.S. will prosecute Huawei China's biggest, most influential telecommunications company for a broad array of alleged crimes. The criminal activity alleged in this indictment goes back at least 10 years and goes all the way to the top of the company. Two grand jury indictments charge Huawei with theft of corporate secrets, evasion of U.S. sanctions on Iran, obstruction of justice, and other offenses. Officials singled out Meng Wanzhou, 
Huawei's chief financial officer and daughter of the company's founder who has deep connections with the Chinese government. The U.S. says Meng worked to evade U.S. sanctions on Iran by selling Huawei products to Tehran using a front corporation set up by Huawei. Meng is under house arrest in Canada. The U.S. plans to extradite her for prosecution. The defendants are variously charged with conspiracy, bank fraud, wire fraud, violations of the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, money laundering, and obstruction of justice. The detention of Meng has infuriated the Chinese government, which is pressuring Canada to let her go free. Beijing arrested two Canadian former diplomats in what is widely seen as retaliation. Officials outlined a tale of audacious corporate espionage in which Huawei officials tried to steal secrets from T-Mobile about a smartphone testing robot called Tappy. Huawei entities directed employees to take photographs, take measurements, and take other protected information without permission. And finally, when all this still did not get them what they were looking for, they tried to steal Tappy's robotic arm in order for engineers in China to replicate it. The Trump administration has been sounding the alarm about China's efforts to achieve supremacy in high technology. Huawei components are being used to create the new architecture of global super high-speed 5G internet technology. Officials say that threatens U.S. national security. As Americans, we should all be concerned about the potential for any company beholden to a foreign government, especially one that doesn't share our values, to burrow into the American telecommunications market. The charges come against the backdrop of the damaging U.S.-China trade war, which has stretched on for months. Trade talks between the two countries will resume on Wednesday. Rob Reynolds, Al Jazeera. The United States is now putting its money, as well as its endorsement, behind the Venezuelan opposition, imposing sanctions on Venezuela's state-owned oil company, PDVSA. The path to sanctions relief for PDVSA is through the expeditious transfer of control to the interim president or a subsequent democratically elected government who is committed to taking concrete and meaningful actions to combat corruption. The Trump administration has President Nicolas Maduro in its sights, hoping to weaken his support with the military, which now controls the oil company and so far is standing behind him. Maduro vowed legal action to protect Citgo, its U.S.-based subsidiary. With this move, they are trying to steal Citgo from us, the Venezuelan people. Be on alert, Venezuela. Today, the United States has decided to take the road of stealing the company Citgo from Venezuela, and that is an illegal road. The aim of the sanctions is to direct oil revenues to the self-declared interim president and opposition leader Juan Guaido who's calling for a day of protest on Wednesday. International observers declared the last presidential election a fraud. Demonstrators have been taking to the streets over the country's dire economic situation, facing violence and mass arrests. People are obviously hungry and tired and desperate. The situation in Venezuela is it's very difficult. And um, they don't see uh, the possibility of change anytime soon. The Trump administration has been warning security officials to back off. We want the Venezuelan security forces to know how strongly we think that President Guaido, the National Assembly, the opposition, and most importantly, American personnel are not harmed. This is an unequivocal statement on our part. Is there any circumstance under which American forces would get involved? Look, the president has made it very clear on this, uh, uh, on this matter that all options are on the table.